Okay. Uh, the only other thing, let's see, somebody came up to me also, and I, I apologize. I, I think one thing I didn't say that I, I should say um, in this sunspot um, correlation with sunspot number, so it's the, the number of sunspots correlated with the cosmic ray intensity, that solar cycle anti-correlation. Uh, why is it that when there's more sunspots, the cosmic rays are fewer? Okay, the indirect thing I didn't say is that when there's more sunspots, the sun is generally more active, has more CMEs, coronal mass ejections, more turbulence, the field tends to be stronger, lots more transients. Cosmic rays have a much more difficult time to swim against that. When the sun has few sunspots, it tends to be, the, the solar wind tends to be quieter. Okay. So that, those, that, that's, that's the, the, the thing I didn't say. That was the cryptic thing I didn't say. Okay, I want to just do, um, let's see if this goes to the end, it doesn't. Well, let me just do it this way. I wanted to just say one thing, uh, one piece of topical information here. And then I'm going to go on and start talking about, so actually they're lecturing something here. Um, and by the way, let me show this slide real quick. This is the cosmic rays during the last sunspot minimum. So this is measurements, uh, combining measurements from the neutron monitor, but also spacecraft measurements. Uh, the blue I want you to, to look at, the blue is ACE measurements of cosmic rays going through the last sunspot minimum, which I, I think you all rem realize was a very unusual minimum. It was long-lived, it was deep, very, very few sunspots. I held a summer school, which I think Terry gave a lecture or two at that one, and I remember having a telescope set up outside for the students to look at the sun every day, and it was the most boring time the sun could possibly have. There was nothing to look at. Okay, there, there it is. It's a big orange disc. Okay, let's go inside. Okay, um, but nevertheless, this, this, the cosmic rays reached an all-time maximum. Okay, can we understand how that happens? Well, it turns out that the solar wind was considerably weaker. That's been quantitatively shown. The solar wind was considerably weaker. The magnetic field was considerably weaker. The solar wind flux was considerably weaker. And these things, and it turns out that cosmic rays are actually uh, susceptible to magnetic field strength. Probably the magnetic field strength is the most important characteristic for determining the intensity of cosmic rays. So when the field is weaker, the, the diffusion coefficient, which causes, allows the particles to come in, was larger, leading to easier access into the solar system. So that's why it was the largest. You might also note the red is anomalous cosmic rays produced by acceleration in the outer heliosphere, actually were lower than the previous cycle. Okay, So anomalous cosmic rays were lower. While they had easier, the interpretation of this is that while they had easier access into the solar system, they still have, I mean, they're still moving through the same field that the galactic cosmic rays are. It's not a transport issue. The interpretation that I think is the most well accepted for this is that the anomalous cosmic rays were, there were fewer of them produced at the termination shock. Weaker fields, less intense acceleration. So fewer were produced. So it was just simply a matter of the source being less. Okay? But anyways, that was the last sunspot cycle. Now the last thing I wanted to say, has Voyager 1 entered the interstellar medium? This is, I just wanted to say a couple things before I move on to my second lecture. This is the big controversy. Galactic cosmic rays for, for many years were just sort of smoothly rising very, very slowly. Okay? As we're, the voyagers were moving out, they were moving out through the heliosphere. And this started in 1912. In 1912, nobody knew where this ionizing radiation was coming from. Some people thought that it came from the Earth, that it was radiation from the Earth. Victor Hass got in a balloon and said, well, if that's the case, I'm going to go up in the balloon, and as I go higher in the atmosphere, the cosmic rays should go down. He found quite the opposite. Cosmic rays won up. He had did a several experiments for this, won the Nobel Prize. Okay? Actually, the centenary, the anniversary was, it was just recently. Last year, there was a big conference in Denver celebrating the 100-year uh, anniversary of the discovery of cosmic rays. But it keeps going up. It's still going up. 100 AU later, the cosmic rays are still going up. We haven't seen the, the source of these galactic cosmic rays. Going up slow. And then all of a sudden, last May, a very unusual jump, huge, huge jump in a very, very short period of time. Okay? And simultaneously, well, okay, actually, 
the May event was a little sooner here. The, actually, then it kind of it went up and then it kind of leveled off, and then it went up again and then leveled off. Okay, this is also include. So this is galactic cosmic rays. You see a little a, a go up. And it goes up and it goes up rapidly. Now cosmic rays are moving fast, and they are spread. Their diffusion coefficient is large. They they shouldn't respond. They should not be huge gradients in cosmic rays. Anytime you have a huge gradient in energetic particles, that implies an anisotropy, that the particles have to be, you know, you're near a source or something like that. Because when they start transporting in the medium, they're going to smooth out. So something like this is really unusual, these, these big gradients. Um, at the time of these gradients, low energy, anomalous cosmic rays, the low energy particles, which are produced further in, now, because remember, voyagers are beyond the termination shock now, dropped off. And in fact, right now, they're not measuring cosmic rays at all. The reason why this is not zero right here is because you're measuring penetrating cosmic rays. You're actually measuring the noise from galactic cosmic rays. So Voyager has crossed something for which the galactic cosmic rays are more or less uniform. Anomalous cosmic rays have gone to zero, basically zero. OK, so what, what's going on? It turns out that this is exactly what you would expect if you cross the heliopause. If you cross the heliopause boundary and are now in interstellar space, you should be seeing cosmic rays that come from outside the you know, solar system, you know, supernovae remnants and stuff like that. You should be seeing the sea of cosmic rays. It should be fairly uniform, which it roughly is, although there are variations which are, we don't understand. Um, you would expect the anomalous cosmic rays to go away, and that's simply because the, once the anomalous cosmic rays get onto magnetic field lines, that are connected to interstellar space, those magnetic field lines are extremely smooth. The interstellar magnetic field is not turbulent like the solar wind magnetic field is. Okay? There's, there's actually good reasons to expect that, because the turbulence of the interstellar magnetic field is dominated by things at scales of parsecs. So if you take a power spectrum of the turbulent magnetic field, which I don't know how much you know about power spectra, but power spectra is a distribution of scales. There's less and less power as you go to shorter and shorter wavelength waves. If all of the power is at the large wavelengths, there's very little power left in scales that are the size of, say, the heliosphere. So there should be hardly any wiggles in the magnetic field of 100 AU. Okay? There shouldn't be wiggles. The field should be very smooth on the scale of 100 AU. So when it, an anomalous cosmic ray gets onto that, it just shoots off. It's, it leaks off, and it's gone, and you don't see it anymore. So this is what you would expect if we were in interstellar space. And I think that was a lot of scientists were, were, were both happy because we finally crossed the interstellar boundary. Some who have been involved with Voyager their whole lives were sad because they said, oh my gosh, you know, this is maybe the end of my career you know, because I'm not going to measure anything anymore. We've crossed it. Um, and and you know, of course, everybody else was puzzled and excited. The problem is the following. that. The magnetic field did not change direction. Okay, so here is the Voyager One uh, cosmic rays. Uh, let's see. Yeah, th I'm sorry. This is the magnetic field strength. So this is all magnetic field strength. This is particles down here. This is the anomalous cosmic rays. You see the big drop off. So this last red boundary is what we would call the helio cliff. It's been referred to as the helio cliff. The problem is, is that here is the elevation angle of the magnetic field, and uh, I'm sorry. This is the elevation angle of the magnetic field. This is the azimuth. Um, you know, the B phi, how about calling this B phi and this roughly B theta, where theta is the polar angle and phi is the azimuthal coordinate. The magnetic field did not change direction. The magnetic field magnitude went up, and this magnetic field strength of about four microgauss is roughly consistent with what we think the interstellar magnetic field strength is, so that's all fine. But the field did not change direction. That is the real puzzle, and that's why Voyager team has not said that we're in the interstellar space because we don't understand why that magnetic field did not change direction. Why should the interstellar magnetic field be the same direction as the solar magnetic field? That's, that's the question. Okay? So theorists are, are all having fun laying ideas out on the table. So where do we stand on this? I, basically, we stand where I just said. Yes? Yeah. Well, because of these particle dropouts, that was the main thing. Those dropouts... It's clearly something new. There's, there's clearly something bizarre going on. I mean, if you look at this, these dropouts, I mean, for, for, this was from, okay, we crossed the termination shock. The particles went up a little bit. 
we never have seen zero. We've never seen zero <laughs> anomalous cosmic rays. So going to zero is quite something. It was flat like this for, for five years, flat, and boom, boom, uh, gone. Okay? So this is why they're press releases. And I think the initial thought was that we've crossed into interstellar space, so that's why they had all these press releases. But then the magnetometer PI, well, the magnetometer team, and the, and the Voyager team followed, of course. Uh, they're all part of the same team. Said, wait a minute, the magnetic field hasn't changed direction. We're still inside the solar system, according to the magnetic field. But this happened. And like I said, theorists are having uh, fun with this, I, I think. I don't know if we're having fun or not. You know, we're having fun. We're debating a lot. OK, how about that? And if you, if you go, I'll make it to the Voyager, um, uh, excuse me, if you'll make it to the uh, AGU meeting, the fall AGU meeting this next year in December, we have a special session actually called Voyager Crossed into the Interstellar Space with a question mark. Okay. This is what's going on today. So what's going on today is no particles. Okay. <laughs> cosmic rays, there are some unusual things about cosmic rays going on, but I, um, <laughs> let's see. Okay, now I want to move on to my next lecture. All right, are there any questions, by the way, about that? Yeah. Actually, of course. Yeah. Yeah, there are, yes, there are latitudinal variations of cosmic rays, and that's something that Ulysses studied, studied in particular, because Ulysses had a polar orbit, and it, there are latitudinal variations of cosmic rays, but the general 11-year anti-correlation between sunspot number and cosmic rays still holds. The latitudinal gradients are very small, but they're there. Yes, they are there, and, and, and it's actually quite interesting. It does tell you something about the nature of the magnetic field of the sun. Okay, the, and the, the cryptic thing I'm saying here, I don't know how much, I don't know if anybody's actually derived the Parker spiral magnetic field or anything like that, but the, the, the magnetic field of the solar system is generally governed, the average component is basically the Parker spiral, which is an Archimedean spiral. That actually does not have a latitudinal component. Okay, it's only got a phi component and a radial component. So there is no you know, north-south component of that magnetic field. And so that actually uh, would mean something for cosmic rays. It would be a little bit less turbulence coming in over the poles, and so they should have easier access. And so you should expect large latitudinal gradients. But it turns out the gradients are pretty small. So that means that you must have a significant latitudinal component. And there were a couple of ideas proposed for that back uh, in, in Ulysses' heyday time, sort of mid-'90s. And um, well, I don't want to go into the controversy on that, but, but basically, I, we, it, it tells us something about the magnetic field. Yeah. Um, yes? Oh, and Voyager 2. Well, Voyager 1 is probably done. From what I understand, it's been measuring the same thing now since last uh, fall. Well, it's measuring no... It's measuring no... <laughs> it's measuring no um, OK, yeah, let me tell you a little bit about Voyager. Voyager, first of all, does not have a, solar, a functioning solar wind instrument. It got knocked out during the Saturn encounter. Okay? It does measure low energy charged particles. This is from like 50 keV up to several MeV. Those are basically at zero. So I, I think those people that are measuring those are sad, OK? Because they're not measuring anything anymore. Although they do have a galactic cosmic ray channel, and so most of their activity is focused on that. Galactic cosmic rays are, they are measuring galactic cosmic rays because they're in interstellar space. And then the magnetom, magnetic field they're measuring. But Yeah. That's right. So that's a very good point. Voyager 2, which is lagging behind, but in a different hemisphere, uh, it's, that's really going to be the next exciting thing, is when Voyager 2, which does have a functioning plasma instrument and can measure the solar wind, because the density of interstellar space, the real smoking gun, and, and I think everybody believes, everybody realizes, is that the density of the solar wind plasma, which falls off as 1 over r squared and is 5 particles per cubic centimeter at 1 AU, is piddly nothing at 120 AU. Okay, there's hardly any. I, I, I just work it out. So it's 1 over 120 squared times 5 particles per cubic centimeter. But the density of the ionized component of the interstellar medium is something like 0.1 
particles per cubic centimeter. So like a thousand times or more greater. So when you're measuring the thermal component of the ionized, uh, the thermal ionized component of the interstellar medium, the density should be enormous. So if it had a functioning plasma instrument and it was measuring this huge density, then I think everybody would agree we're probably in interstellar space. So that Voyager 2, that's going to be exciting. And, and I, I hope it happens, happens soon. Well, I don't know. It, it is kind of, it, it's, it's a little fun and it's also a little dismaying having these debates, but it, I think mostly fun. Um, sometimes the debates get a little old. But <laughs> um, OK, so for my second lecture, I, I should start keeping track of time because I'm probably already out of time. I'm, I'm, I'm actually supposed to finish at what exactly, 10.15? OK, well, let me just continue. I, I, won't do my, I won't do my introduction slide because I've already done that. I've already talked about that. Let me get into some actual uh, quantitative stuff. So um, I, this is hopefully a review, but maybe not. If it's not a review, huh? Oh, I'll do the best I can. I'll, OK, or, or 1040. Or, OK, <laughs> I'll, do the, I'll do the best I can, right? Um, OK, so I just want to say a couple concepts here. First of all, when I'm talking about distribution functions, I, I, hopefully this is review, but I just want to take very briefly to go over it. Uh, we're talking of uh, the, the uh, irrelevant quantity to, to the scientists is the distribution function, what's called the phase-based distribution function, F, which I denote with F. F is a function of seven coordinates, basically, three spatial coordinates and three momentum coordinates. I like to write things in terms of momentum, because that way if I move over to astrophysics, uh, I don't have to worry too much. Okay. Um, and time. It's always normalized in such a way that the density is defined this way. Okay? Density is the integral of the distribution over the momentum coordinates. Okay? And this is the way one can write this. Uh, you can do a linear thing. This is actually turns out to not be all that useful, so I don't use it that much. Okay? <laughs> but uh, the number density can be an integral over the three momentum coordinates. Uh, you know, px, py, pz, if you want to do this in Cartesian. Uh, I don't know. And I, I tend to like to do cosmic rays in terms of spherical coordinates. Again, spherical momentum coordinates. So that, the, the, say, the polar angle in that case is its pitch angle. Its pitch angle relative to, the, say, the average magnetic field direction. That would be theta. Okay? Phi would be the phase angle. Particles gyrate about the magnetic field, so phi would be the phase angle. Cosmic rays, wonderfully, are uniform. Very uniform. They all they tend to be moving uh, in totally random directions. That's something that we say is very isotropic. Cosmic rays are very isotropic. Um, there is an anisotropy. That's a whole branch of cosmic ray studies too, is to study the anisotropy. But the anisotropy is extremely small. It's known to be very small. Why is that wonderful? Well, that's wonderful because I can. This f does not depend on theta or phi. Okay, it's usually just a function of momentum, the magnitude of the momentum. And so this just gives you 4 pi. Okay. The integral, that, that, that integral just gives you 4 pi. OK. As a theorist, I always use f. Theorists usually use f. Okay. Observers don't like to think in terms of f. Very, well, I, I, I should, that, that's being a little unkind. Uh, they don't usually measure f directly. What you're measuring is a flux. You're measuring the number of particles crossing your detector per time number per square centimeter per time, and you know how big your detector is. So you're really measuring a flux, so why not plot the flux? And so, um, so what observers tend to plot is called the differential intensity, which uh, the differential intensity is really the flux per solid angle per energy. Well, I'm sorry, yeah, the differential intensity is flux per solid angle per energy. And that's basically what they measure, because they have an energy to band, they can measure particles of a certain energy range over some solid angle, and they know the number coming into their detector per time, and they know the solid angle, or they know the um, cross-section of their detector. Okay, so they, that, that's the most natural thing to plot. And so that is what most, most observations show. Every once in a while, I'll see one plotted with F, but that's usually been a conversion to F, maybe to appease the theorists, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so that's what differential intensity is. So that's what's being plotted when I plot this cosmic ray spectrum here particles per square centimeter per second per steridian per MeV in this case, per energy. And it's, it's related through this, p squared f. It's a very simple thing. Okay. I just want to I, I make that note, because I've run into, 
some people not realizing. Like, like students, when I, when I teach graduate level course on this, I, I very commonly see that they forget to, that this is differential intensity <laughs> that's being plotted. And so you have to be careful of the conversions. OK, so if I'm thinking about charged particles moving in a magnetic field, I mean, this is really, this is basically the physics that we solve. We solve the Lorentz force acting on a charged particle. I mean, what else is there? There's electric field and there's a magnetic field. And I, I am talking about, uh, you know, I, I'm not talking about, the, say, the photosphere where collisions are common. Okay? I'm talking about the corona out to, well, out to wherever, okay? where the density is extremely tenuous so that particle-particle collisions can be ignored. Okay? So these, that's basically where you would get energetic particles. If there's a lot of collisions, they'll thermalize, and you'll get roughly a Maxwellian distribution. So you need to have this uh, lack of collisions, actual particle-particle collisions for the particles to exist. So really, it just comes down to solving this equation. The problem is E is very complicated, and B is very complicated. Okay, So this is not easy to solve. You have to solve it on a computer uh, in most situations. And also, this is just one particle. Okay, There's, of course, gazillions of cosmic rays, so solving one isn't necessarily useful. Sometimes it gives you a little bit of a guide, but you've got to be careful basing too much of what you're concluding on the motion of one particle. You really need to be looking at a collection of them. Uh, you can add other forces, gravity, radiation pressure, if you want. But uh, I think in most situations, they're small. OK, I, I'm going to skip through this very quickly. I just want to sort of lead up to, uh, lead up to the transport equation. That's where I'm going with this. And I think I probably have about 30 seconds to do that. No. I ha OK, I got about 10, 15 minutes. Um, OK. I, ho hopefully, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know the backgrounds of everybody, but uh, perhaps you've, you've solved this equation in the simplest possible scenario where the magnetic and electric fields are constant. And in fact, let me just take the electric field to be zero. This is the absolute simplest possible case. Constant magnetic field, let's take it to be along the x direction, the electric field to be zero. Then you just simply have a, a fairly straightforward equation to solve. You can solve that, and all you're getting is gyro motion. So it's the, it's the well-known a helical motion of the particle. So the result is, and this is the quantitative solution to this, okay, sines and cosines, basically. Um, this is called the gyro frequency. It's something that comes out of it. The length of, it's actually 2 pi divided by that is how long it takes the particle to complete one full gyration, okay? Um, the particle energy is conserved because the magnetic field actually does not lead to energy. You need an electric field to change the energy of the particle. So the particle's magnitude of its velocity is conserved. And also is the parallel. The component parallel to the magnetic field is conserved. It turns out that the, the z component of this equation gives you that the parallel velocity is constant. So all that you have is you have a, the magnetic field this way and the particle's gyrating about it. Okay? That's that solution. That's the easiest case. The, the second most easiest case is where I add an electric field but make the electric field constant. And clever people will say, let me find a way to transform that electric field away. So you can do a Lorentz transformation, find the proper transformation velocity so that if I go into that other frame, the electric field has gone away, and then I'll just go back and use what I had done before. That's a, that, that's a clever way to do it. Okay? If you don't do that, you can just as easily solve it. These are, these, are, these are relatively straightforward to solve. And in this case, all that you find is that in addition to that gyro motion, you also have a drift. You have a drift that is normal to both the electric field and the magnetic field. So if the magnetic field in this case is into the board and the electric field is pointing upward, then the drift of a proton would be this way. The, elect the drift velocity is given by this, this expression. This is called the electric field drift. Cosmic rays experience this, and this is what causes them to be swept out by the solar wind. This drift is actually in a direction to try to keep them away. Okay. And by the way, I have been careful to take an electric field. that when dotted, There's no parallel electric fields in this case. This is true for ideal MHD. If I write E as U cross B, which is, that's the relevant electric field for cosmic rays, uh, small electrostatic fields, which are common near shocks, near reconnection events, sometimes small electric fields, polarization electric fields resulting from gradients in the electron pressure, things like that, which can be added to the MHD equation for the electric field, are generally small for cosmic rays. You don't worry about them. Okay? So it's the U cross B electric field that's relevant to cosmic rays. So the U cross B electric field is dotted into B as 0. Okay, now what happens if I have a fluctuating magnetic field? Well, there's, I want to separate this into two different discussions. 
if I have a fluctuating magnetic field, but it fluctuates on a very large scale, so that the characteristic scale is large compared to the gyro radius of the particle. So here's my little particle gyrating on the magnetic field. Its gyro radius is tiny compared to the characteristic scale of the fluctuation. Then in this case, uh, you can actually solve the equations by expanding in a parameter, a dimensionless parameter, the gyro radius divided by the length scale. You can actually do this. So, you, so you, you go back to the Lorentz force, you put in your fluctuating magnetic field, and you actually expand your solutions you, uh, about a quantity that's a small quantity, Rg divided by L. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of this tedious stuff, but they're in textbooks. Okay, Then you, you can expand that, and then you find that there's drifts that come out of this. This is something called the guiding center approximation. So what you're really describing is the motion of the guiding center, the, the center of gyration of the particle. Okay, so you get the gyro motion, gyro motion, but you also get drifts due to the large-scale motions. There are a whole slew of drifts. Well, actually, there's one, there's one guiding center drift equation, and that's this one right here. Okay, it's very complicated. I don't want to go into the details. But uh, good textbooks will have this written down, okay? the, um, <clears throat> the complete guiding center drift equation. So this is the motion of the center of gyration of the particle. W, big W is the energy, the perpendicular component of the kinetic energy. W parallel over here is the parallel component of the kinetic energy. Often this is separated into drifts associated with gradients in the magnetic field. And the gradient of the magnetic field, that can actually be visualized quite easy. Imagine over here the magnetic field is strong, and over here the magnetic field is weak. Okay? And now imagine a particle gyrating. It gets over here. It's got a small gyro radius. It's, it's trying to gyrate, but the field is strong, and so it's got a tiny gyro radius. It comes over here, it's weak, and so oh, it's got a much bigger gyro radius. The orbit doesn't quite hook up on itself, and so it actually has a net drift, in this case, up, the way I just described that. So, that's, so gradients in the magnetic field produce a gradient drift. Curvature of the lines of force also produce a drift. Now, you can explicitly write the gradient and curvature drifts like this. Some textbooks do this. If they don't also state simultaneously that this is only for the uh, particular approximation of a curl-free magnetic field, then, then they're not being correct. Okay? These are the correct drifts, gradient curvature drifts, only if, the, if curl B is 0. Okay, <clears throat> Why did I go through all of this? Is because the cosmic ray transport equation often is written in terms of a drift velocity. The drift velocity is, is basically an average over an isotropic distribution of particles. So if I have a collection of cosmic rays, again, this is just for one particle. But if I have a collection of cosmic rays that are isotropic, as I've already said they're isotropic, then if you average that over the isotropic distribution, this is the net drift velocity for any given magnetic field configuration. Again, large scales. This is not the resonant stuff. This is the large scale drift. OK, so the, the cosmic ray transport equation often has that written in there. All right, now the second part of the discussion, what happens when the gyro radius is comparable to the wiggles? If it's comparable to the wiggles, then you get scattering. Okay, Particles, this was, I kind of talked about this before. It goes in, and it'll just go bouncing back and forth. This is basically a random walk. So you get a random walk process. Uh, this is actually a numerical simulation. So I t actually took one of these. So I took a magnetic field. I created wiggles. Here are the wiggles right here. Uh, the magnetic field, as you might be able to tell, these are field lines. The dashed blue lines are field lines. The magnetic field average is in the x direction, but the wiggles are caused by turbulence. This is an actual trajectory of a particle. And it turns out that if you follow this particle in the z coordinate, at about 100 gyro periods, it turned around and went back. Okay? So this is a scattering. So when it did this, it scattered. You'll notice that its pitch angle, which is the angle uh, the velocity vector makes with, the, with respect to the average magnetic field, went from plus 1, meaning it's going up, to minus 1 going down. So it, it basically is scattered. It didn't bounce off of a brick wall, but it basically did something that's analogous to it hitting a brick wall. This is a scattering event. By the way, um, you might notice from this image it's interesting how the particle basically retraced its steps, didn't it? This particle went up, scattered, and came almost came right, it came right back. It basically retraced its steps. You got to be very careful here. I want to try to make this message as clear as I can. Is that you got to be careful about the dimensionality of the magnetic field, and and drawing trying to draw important conclusions about particle motions 
in what are called restricted geometries. This is a restricted geometry. This magnetic field that I chose actually had, it was a magnetic field in the, in the x direction, but its fluctuations were only in z. In other words, I made it like a, a sine, sine k, kz or something. Okay? So I did not allow for fluctuations of the magnetic field in the y and z directions. Okay? So that, this is something referred to as slab turbulence. Okay? If you do that, the equations of motion dictate that a particle will forever be tied to the same magnetic field line on which it starts, its motion. So if you're trying to study the transport of particles across magnetic field lines using a magnetic field that only varies on one spatial dimension, that is, B is only a function of B of Z, for example, you're not going to ever be able to study cross-field diffusion. Okay? You have to make it a function of all three dimensions. And for those who remember Hamilton or have studied physics and done Hamiltonian dynamics, the Hamiltonian formalism, it turns out that the reason is, is that when you have ignorable coordinates, the canonical momentum in the direction of that ignorable coordinate is conserved. And as a consequence of that, the particles are tied to field lines. So you've got to make your, your magnetic field be a function of three coordinates, not just, not just one or two, even. There, there are slight exceptions to that rule, but they're, they're not very useful. Here is, by the way, some orbits. This is a two-dimensional magnetic field, and this particle was followed for many, many thousands of gyro periods, and it just simply went back and forth and back and forth along the same magnetic field lines forever. So be careful if you're going to kind of go into this area ever, okay? Because you, you could get fooled about the results. Um, this is an actual particle moving in a 3D mag magnetic field, showing particles can actually move across magnetic fields, but for a 3D magnetic field. Um, okay, I think I should be finishing here, but I want to kind of hit a, a couple of punchlines real quick. So the random walk, the actual scattering events, is basically a random walk. And if you have a random walk, the mean squared displacement of particles relative to their initial position. You think of the drunken sailor walking this way and then walking that way, and, and you work out its mean squared displacement as a function of time. It's linear. This is a diffusive process. I've, I've purposely set the proportionality constant to be 2 kappa, because in the, the way I've set this proportionality constant, kappa is strictly the diffusion equation, uh, excuse me, diffusion coefficient, and actually written this way. Um, this would be, if you had a collection of random walking particles, this would be the equation that would govern their distribution with time and space. Now, if I took that and asked, what is the average x, x squared position of this, it would actually obey that equation. Okay? This is a diffusive process. And again, they're not hitting off of brick walls. They're just scattering off of random magnetic irregularities. And um, the diffusion coefficient is, is, can be related to something known as the mean free path the distance it goes between scattering events with this simple relationship. You've got to be a little bit careful, though, when we're talking about space plasmas and cosmic rays and charged particles, because the motion across the magnetic field, as you might guess just from looking at this figure, um, this figure, come on, that one, that actually the particles tend to want to go along the magnetic field a lot easier than they do across it. So the diffusion in the direction of the magnetic field is actually uh, different from that across it. So you've got to be a little bit careful, but um, the basic concept is that. If you solve the diffusion equation for a, probably one of the simplest situations, and that is an impulsive release, I like to think of the solar flare problem. Imagine a solar flare, boom, a whole bunch of particles, and then two seconds later, nothing. Okay? That's an impulsive release of particles. And then I follow, what, are the, what does the particle event look like in space? Well, right after the release, you have a whole bunch of them, and then they diffuse away. That's what diffusion is. The solution is this, okay? n0 being the number of particles that you have. And if you're at 1 AU asking what does it look like as a function of time, this is my handwritten. Normally, I give these lectures, by the way, on blank transparencies, and so I just copied over one of my, one of my scanned transparencies. But this would be the distribution function of the energetic particles as a function of time at, say, 1 AU. You'd get nothing for a while, then all of a sudden it would rise and then slowly decay away with time. That's that, that, in other words, that's that solution I had written on the previous slide plotted at a given x as a function of time. That looks roughly similar to SEP events, roughly. Okay, Rise, slow decay, rise, slow decay. So that's why solar energetic particles are often thought of being diffusive. It's obviously more complicated than that. But. 
Here's a well-known, this was a sort of one of, the, one of the original ones that were done on this. There was a big event in the 50s, and uh, you see this big you know, fit. So again, it's diffusive-like fit. So that's what people do to try to work out mean free paths. You gotta be a little, I'm, I'm kind of zipping through these because I kind of want to get to the, the actual transport equation at the end. But anyways, you have to be a little bit careful because you can have diffusion in different directions. And the final point I want to, a couple of the final points I want to make is that you have to add advection with the flow. I've already kind of mentioned that, that the scattering happens in a frame moving with the fluid. So if you're thinking about a collection of particles, you have to be also worried about convection or advection is the proper term. That shows up like this in the equation. There's also energy change. <clears throat> What's interesting about this form of energy change, and there's various ways to derive this. Um, Energy change results from compressions or expansions of the plasma. So uh, if, if imagine a particle with a particular energy in a certain fluid element, now it goes over and uh, is in a different velocity fluid element when it scatters, it will have actually changed its energy in the local fluid frame. So you can actually do that. You can actually say, imagine it scatters here with this fluid speed, speed. Now let me let it scatter over in a different fluid speed and ask what was the net change in the energy in the plasma frame of reference. And you'll find it changes. And it changes by this for an isotropic distribution. But you can show this more rigorously. And by the way, you'll note that there's no electric field in that equation. But it's there. I don't know why it's not jumping so quick. OK, it's there. You can start with the actual equation for energy change of a charged particle, which is an electric field, is what causes that. The magnetic field doesn't cause the energy change. It's the electric field. This right here, d by dt of the energy, is minus q, w is the particle speed dotted into the electric field. This is the work done by the electric field. Okay? Okay, this is, the, this is just basic equations of motion. But if you plug in the u cross b electric field from the uh, ideal MHD, that's basically what we do for cosmic rays, and then through various vector identities, playing with this equation, vector identities, and then at the end, averaging over an isotropic distribution of particles, you can basically get the same term that shows up in the Parker equation. So it can be shown rigorously from the particle motion as well. And this is a very important term. In fact, cosmic rays are actually thought to be, the modulation is thought to be because of cooling. If I take a cosmic ray at 1 AU, and now imagine going backwards in time. Let me go backwards in time. Backwards in time, it gains energy. Because okay, as I said, any particle cools in the solar wind forward in time. But backward in time, it was a higher energy. If I follow it back to where it entered the solar system at a higher energy, the distribution, there were a lot fewer of them. Okay? And since something called Liouville's theorem says that phase-based trajectories have to be conserved, there's the, the, the number of them are lower at that, that energy. So there's a modulation just by energy change. Okay. So I think I'll just write down the Parker transport equation, and that's it in its, in its glory. And I think this will probably be my, I don't think I have anything else to say after this. But this is the equation first written down by Parker. I think all of the, I, I've tried to go through and give a kind of an intuitive feel for all these terms. So this is advection with the flow, which we've talked about. This is spatial diffusion arising from scattering, pitch angle scattering predominantly, but also scattering across the magnetic field can be contained in this. This is the drift that I mentioned, due to large scale variations in the magnetic field, larger than the gyro radius of the particles. And I had a specific form for that written down. And this is energy change. The main assumption in this equation, and the only assumption really, is that the distribution function is isotropic. So if you have an isotropic distribution, you can use this equation. If you don't have an isotropic distribution, such as solar energetic particles, during the very beginning of the event, they tend to be coming out field aligned. But after a couple of days, they're, they're isotropic. But the beginning of the event, you won't be able to use this equation. But it's a very useful equation whenever you have an isotropic distribution. Galactic cosmic rays, isotropic. I can use this equation. And this is at the, basically most people that do energetic particle transport at some point use this equation, sometimes make an extension beyond it to include pitch angle scattering and things like that. But um, or excuse me, pitch angle, you know, the pitch angle information is something called focus transport, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay, I've been told to cut off. Um, do we have questions? Yeah. Source. Yeah. So in the case of galactic cosmic rays, I would make um, Q some constant at R equal 100 AU or something like that. For a solar energetic particle event, I might make Q a delta function in time times some power law or something in momentum or something like that. 
Yeah. I mean, now it turns into an initial slash boundary value problem at this point. It is a complicated equation written like this, okay? But I can simplify it, put it into spherical coordinates, and so on. And I should warn you, one of my homework questions, actually, I, I, you, if you were basing your uh, solution on things that I've talked about today, you probably will really struggle with it. But if you, if you look at the textbook chapter, I, I kind of go through what would happen if I wrote this in spherical coordinates, for example. Um, and the homework questions, I don't know, good luck. <laughs> um, one of them is really pure discussion. Okay, that's number two, total discussion. Uh, number three B is, is kind of a trick question. So don't spend all of your waking hours trying to figure out how to do three B. Okay. Take a break.